Uh, good morning, everyone, um, and thank you very much indeed for uh, inviting me along to speak today. It's, it's, it's um, a privilege to be among so many uh, folks from uh, what, for, for me, is the other side of the world, um, working uh, uh, and researching um, uh, in relation to victims of crime. Uh, I'm going to talk to you this morning about participation in the criminal justice system uh, and in particularly the idea of a right to participation and what that might entail. Now I apologise and declare my ignorance at the outset of uh, the various legal systems that operate in the jurisdictions around Australia. Um, my background is, uh, well, Northern Ireland originally, uh, now working in, in England, so uh, a lot of what I have to say um, relates from my own knowledge of how victims uh, participate in those jurisdictions. Um, but what I also hope to do in the course of my presentation is just highlight some developments uh, that for the most part are pretty positive developments uh, on the international platform. Uh, so throughout the course of my presentation I will, for example, uh, refer to you uh, to some emerging uh, guidelines and standards of best practice that are coming out of organisations such as uh, the UN, uh, the, the Council of Europe, European Court of Human Rights, uh, European Union, and uh, I'll also uh, mention uh, some developments that have happened at the International Criminal Court. Now, obviously, uh, when we're looking to what's happening elsewhere, we have to be careful because uh, it's not always uh, as easy as just lifting what's works or what seems to work in one jurisdiction and transplanting it into another. But I hope at least uh, that some of the uh, things I'm going to, to highlight for you provide some food for thought and uh, perhaps some ideas as to uh, how you might move law, policy uh, and, and practice forwards in giving victims a greater participatory role in criminal proceedings. Um, I'm going to start off just by asking the question, what, what do we mean by uh, participation? Um, because it is quite a, an abstract term and lacks uh, a concrete uh, definition. Uh, UK academic Ayn Edwards uh, came up with this um, uh, explanation of it. He said that it connotes being in control or having a say, being listened to or being treated uh, with uh, respect or dignity. So. While perhaps it might seem that the idea of participation is quintessentially uh, a good thing within the criminal justice system, there are, as uh, the attorney suggested, uh, various debates going around about uh, what that participation uh, should entail. It's, and it is perhaps a contentious matter even among victims themselves, uh, let alone uh, among uh, policy makers um, and lawmakers. So, uh, participation can entail a number of different things, and uh, it can also take place uh, at various different parts of, of, of the process. So, we can talk about participation uh, pre-trial, even uh, around the time of, of, of the charge or the complaint is made, uh, right through uh, within trial itself, uh, sentencing, or even uh, post-conviction, post-sentencing stage of the criminal justice system. Um, the other thing I thought it may be helpful to discuss at the, the outset is just what we mean by a right to participation. Um, because the, the language of rights can be quite commonly found, you know, victims' rights is found. It's found a lot in the media. Um, it's found a lot in sort of uh, political rhetoric and, and, and discourse. Uh, and I guess we need to clarify a little bit about what we, we mean by right because there has been the suggestion, uh, for example, that something perhaps um, can't be regarded as a right or shouldn't be regarded as a right if it lacks legal teeth. Um, and so though we have, a, a, as I say, although there's a lot of rhetoric around the ideas of rights uh, and the, the rights are enshrined around the, the world and various they're given different names, charters, codes of practices, uh, guidelines, protocols, whatever we might call them. Um, there is, the, 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 uh, I think, an issue as to whether it, it is correct to call these things rights if they are not something that can be actually enforced and relied on 
by victims uh, or victims advocates uh, in a meaningful way. So that's just a, a little caveat that I think is worth perhaps flagging uh, at the outset. Um, let's just have a look at um, the international scene then to say what's being said about participation uh, as a right. Um, start off with uh, the UN Declaration, uh, 1985. Now, I should stress uh, to, to the non-lawyers amongst you, this isn't binding on uh, states. Uh, it's, it's what we call uh, a soft law instrument. It's, it's, it's a set of basic principles. But um, countries uh, which, which sign up to this, uh, which uh, includes Australia, includes the UK, and uh, includes uh, the, the vast majorities of countries. Um, but uh, the idea behind them is that they provide uh, a set of international standards of good practice, if you like. So even though we can't uh, enforce these instruments through our national courts, they are something to which uh, policies and lawmakers uh, should uh, uh, at least uh, try to adhere as a, a point of best practice. So the UN Declaration says that the criminal process should allow the views of concerns of victims to be presented and considered at appropriate stages of proceedings where the personal interests are affected without prejudice to the accused. Uh, more recently we've got a, a handbook uh, issued by the UN in 1999 which uh, again talks about uh, how some of these uh, ideas contained in the, the basic principles might be realised and it talks about how victims assistance organisations and indeed um, uh, governments uh, should take steps to ensure that the victim's opportunity to participate at all critical stages of the criminal process and to ensure consideration of the impact of the victimisation upon the victim in all criminal justice systems and international tribunals. Um, I'd like now just if you, you, you think about w what's happening uh, in Europe for a minute. Um, and uh, in Europe we're quite fortunate in, in a way because uh, we have a lot of countries who have signed up to these uh, supranational structures, uh, one of which is uh, the Council of Europe. That's basically a human rights framework with the Court of Human Rights uh, that adjudicates um, on the European Convention of Human Rights. Uh, a separate organisation also exists. You've probably all heard of the European Union. Again, it's an umbrella organisation of member states who uh, sign up uh, and as part of that process uh, European law is actually binding and directly uh, applicable uh, within member states. So I'll just tell you a little bit about, obviously from an Australian point of view uh, it's not going to be binding, but again I hope that to flag it up as a, a perhaps point of best practice that you might be able to learn from. The European Court of Human Rights then um, has dealt with um, the, 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 the um, uh, issue of participation at uh, Involved. I won't go into the, 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 the facts of Edwards, but I think just the, the, the broad lesson from that, it related to uh, an, an investigation of um, uh, a suicide in a prison. And although the, the victim here was a victim of what we might consider uh, a state crime, or, or uh, uh, I think a lot of the lessons are transferable to so-called ordinary victims of crime as well. Uh, and the court had a lot to say there about the duties in the state to uh, effectively investigate and, and prosecute crime and indeed in relation to participation said that victims should be involved in the procedure to the extent necessary to safeguard uh, their interests. Now that of course is open to interpretation but uh, I think it's representative of some positive language that's coming out of the, uh, the European Court of Human Rights. There's a lot of other cases as well say similar things and I'll be happy uh, later on to discuss uh, any of that uh, case law with you. Um, we've also got uh, in the European Union we've got something called the framework decision on the standing of victims in criminal proceedings and article 3 of um, that um, uh, that instrument gives victims a, a right to be heard and supplied evidence. Now originally uh, when this was first came out in 2001 uh, I think the, the, the prevailing view 
uh, among governments and, and, and academics uh, and, and policy makers was that, well, probably it, it's not going to have a huge impact because the, the, the language used in the instrument was fairly loose um, and, and a wee bit vague. And traditionally, the European Union concerned itself primarily with things like uh, free movement of goods, free movement of persons in the European Union. Uh, it has tended to keep out of the, the criminal justice system. But um, that analysis proved to be a little bit premature. Um, we had um, a case in 2005 taken against Italy by um, uh, called Peppino, and the case concerned an Italian court that had refused to make any special provision for eight young children uh, to give any sort of out-of-court evidence against their, their school teacher. The court had obliged them to give uh, live testimony. Uh, and this was, was challenged and uh, was referred to the European Court of Justice. Uh, and the court said that the framework decision should be interpreted as meaning that the national court must be able to authorise young children who, as in this case, claim to have been victims of maltreatment to give their testimony in accordance with arrangements allowing those children to be guaranteed an appropriate level of protection outside the trial before the takes place and within the trial itself. Um, and uh, although that decision, the thrust of the decision was primarily concerned with the need to protect vulnerable witnesses rather than uh, the, the concept of participation per se, I think um, it's a positive decision in that um, the future relevance of uh, the uh, framework decision in relation to things like participation in the trial and sentencing can't be uh, discounted. The European Court has very much signalled that it stays of uh, taking a back seat in relation to the thorny questions of victim participation is, uh, it, it, it has come to an end. Um, let's have a little look now at what's going on in international criminal tribunals and particularly I'm going to focus on uh, the uh, Rome Statute of the International uh, Criminal Court. Uh, there's quite an innovative uh, provision contained in Article 68 of the Rome Statute um, which uh, allows uh, participation uh, in respect of uh, the personal interest of the victim. Now, that phrase, personal interest of the victim, remains, uh, again, there, there are interpretation issues around that, but uh, it does uh, allow victims uh, to uh, use counsel to make submissions to the court on a variety of matters uh, throughout the, um, the criminal process. Now, uh, these participatory rights can only be granted that with the leave of the court and only if the court satisfied that exercising them would be in a manner which is not prejudicial or consistent with the rights of the accused and a fair and impartial trial. Um, so the participatory rights are there, though they are, I guess, um, the, the, they are going to be conditional on the, the ICC actually granting them. Um, Sorry, I forgot to put up the second provision there. That's uh, n Rule 90 from the Rules of uh, Procedure and Evidence, which just gives us a little more detail on the, the form of participation. Um, but uh, as I say, the, the, it's, it's not a, a, an unqualified right to participate, but uh, it is there and victims uh, can do, uh, on, on paper at least, all of these things. There is some uh, empirical research suggesting that uh, victims, unfortunately, aren't being able to, uh, to exercise uh, these uh, rights as freely as perhaps they, they ought to. So um, there's not a lot of evidence out there, but um, it, there's, there's a little bit of empirical evidence at the minute that perhaps raises our concern. But the fact that it's there on paper, that it seems to have c emerged from consensus of signatory parties to the ICC, is a very positive thing. So I hope that overview of international practice has been useful. What I want to move on to now is sort of the, the nitty-gritty of asking how we might actually realise participatory rights in, in practice. Um, so I'm going to really just look at, 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 at different distinct phases of the criminal process now and, and look at some ways in which participation uh, might be realised. <coughs> 